Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hi there. Um, so good evening and welcome to Chicago Public Library. I'm Sarah Zimmerman with the, Chicago, or with the Cultural, Civic, and Literary Engagement Team in the Adult Services Department here. On behalf of everyone at Chicago Public Library, welcome. And especially welcome this year, which is Chicago P Public Library's 150th anniversary. We'll be celebrating all year, and we would love for you to join us through our variety of events, celebrations, partnerships, and digital content for all ages throughout the year. For more information on everything we have planned, visit www.shypublive.org 150 throughout the year. Before we begin, we ask that you please silence your cell phones. I'd like to thank Chicago Public Library staff who worked to make this event possible and our bookstore's uh, partner, Sand Myers. Books are available for purchase in the lobby and the authors will sign your books at the conclusion of the program. We'll call you up to get your book signed in groups, so please remain seated after the program and wait for instructions. Tonight's event is also being live streamed on CPL's YouTube and Facebook channels and it'll be available for on-demand viewing immediately following the event. After the conversation, our guest will take questions from the audience, from those who line up at the microphone down in front of this stage only. Virtual viewers, please put your questions in the chat and we'll be happy to ask them on your behalf. Chicago Public Library is pleased to welcome Socket Sony to speak on his book, The Great Escape, a true story of forced labor and immigrant dreams in America as part of our Voices for Justice speaker series. And just a, a, a little ask, uh, the Chicago Reader has selected um, Voices for Justice as a finalist for the best lecture series. If you'd like to hop on over there and vote for us, uh, we'd really appreciate that vote. So, Organizer and author Socket Sony is recognized as a national expert on post-disaster economies, immigrant rights, and the future of work. Originally from New Delhi, India, Socket began his career as a community organizer in Chicago at the Coalition of African, Asian, European, and Latino Immigrants of Illinois. After Hurricane Katrina in 2006, Socket co-founded the New Orleans Workers' Center for Racial Justice, and in 2011, he founded the National Guest Worker Alliance, an organization focused on defending the human rights of dignity and dignity of guest, guest workers in America. Socket co-authored And Injustice for All, Workers' Lives in Reconstruction, as well as Never Again, Lessons of the Gustav Evacuation. His new book, The Great Escape, A True Story of Forced Labor and Immigrant Dreams in America, is the astonishing story of one of the largest human trafficking cases in modern American history and the workers' heroic journey for justice. Weaving a deeply personal journey with a riveting tale of 21st century forced labor, Socket takes us into the hidden lives of foreign workers the U.S. increasingly relies on for cheap, skilled labor to rebuild after climate disasters. Socket will be interviewed tonight by Ai Jin Poo, Aijin is a next generation labor leader, award winning organizer, author, and a leading voice in the women's movement. She's the president of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, director of Caring Across Generations, co founder of Supermajority, and trustee for the Ford Foundation. Aijin is a nationally recognized expert on elder and family care, the future of work, gender equality, immigration, narrative change, and grassroots organizing. She's the author of the celebrated book, The Age of Dignity, and together with Alicia Garza, Aijin co-hosts the podcast, Sunstorm. Tonight, please join me in welcoming Socket and Aijin to the CPL stage. Hi, friends. How's everybody feeling on this cold Tuesday evening? Good. Good. This actually looks like a very lively crowd for the, for the conditions that we're in. <laughs> um, we're so excited to be here tonight um, 
For me, this is a very special, I've been looking forward to this literally for weeks now because uh, this book is one of the greatest books I have ever read. <laughs> I'm not kidding, it is, it is incredible. It is what my husband calls an organizing thriller. Did you know such a thing existed? <laughs> It does. It is this book, and it's written by one of my favorite humans and organizers in the country, Mr. Socket Sony, and we get to talk about it tonight. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see, where to begin? So it's actually really special that we're here in Chicago. Uh, the book. The Great Escape, A True Story of Forced Labor and Immigrant Dreams in America. It starts in the great city of New Orleans, but Socket actually has a very special relationship to this great city, Chicago. I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about your story and your relationship to Chicago. Sure. Um, my story actually starts when I came to Chicago from India. I came... Um, as a foreign student to attend the University of Chicago. My parents were the only parents in the history of Indian civilization to let their son go to America for a theater degree. And that's what I did in Chicago. Um, I was studying theater, uh, trying to be a theater director when I um, became undocumented. I missed an immigration deadline. And um, I didn't think it was a very serious issue. Um, I honestly thought it was um, only slightly more difficult a problem to solve than an unreturned library book. Um, in fact, I visited a, a, a very um, Saul Goodman-like lawyer in a Chicago strip mall uh, who told me that very soon there was going to be amnesty for all the undocumented. I'd just get my problem solved by President Bush at the time. Um, but then something changed. 9-11 happened and a lot of undocumented immigrants lost their foothold uh, in the US. Um, that's really what shifted me from um, theater to community organizing. I became a community organizer, but my real training as a community organizer started when I got to New Orleans. I went as a relief worker for two weeks. I ended up staying 16 years, and um, I saw how the um, flooding after Katrina had turned the Gulf Coast into the world's largest construction site. And I started a, a small labor rights nonprofit to protect the workers who were doing it. That's what I was doing when I got the mysterious midnight phone call um, that, starts, um, that starts the story in the book. Let's talk about that night. Uh, the opening line of this book is extraordinary. Um, first line, when my parents called me the night of my 29th birthday, I was lying in wait for a human smuggler. <laughs> what an opener. And you were. Talk to us about what was going on that night. I was. Um, you know, my poor parents uh, called me, and I think I uh, picked up once and said, I'm on a stakeout. <laughs> I'll call you back. And then I never called back. My poor mother. Um, <laughs> We were, um, I, 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 it, was a, it was a day at work, but a really extraordinary one. Um, you know, as organizers, we solve workers' problems, right? That's, that's basically what we're put on earth to do. And that day, uh, we were solving a really extraordinary problem. I was trying to um, help a Honduran day laborer ransom his kidnapped nephew from a coyote. Mm -hmm. And uh, we succeeded, and it was my birthday, so I went back home after we finished the job and, um, uh, and I poured myself uh, a drink and I got a phone call. And um, I would get calls all night long from workers who needed help um, from across the Gulf Coast, but something sounded different about this worker. And I realized it was the, d the way he was saying my name. He said it the right way, the way people say it in India. And he was from India. He had flown all the way and I wondered what he was doing in the ruins of the Mississippi Gulf Coast after Katrina. And it turned out that he was one of 500 workers mm. that had been flown there. Uh, one of 500 that um, I, want, well, I went on a hunt for um, and, and found in a labor camp in Mississippi. Mm. 
you will fall in love so quickly with every last character in this book. There's some extraordinary um, stories and people with extraordinary stories. Um, and the scene, one of my favorite scenes from the book is when you actually meet the workers in person for the first time. And it was so resonant and powerful for me because it's one of those meetings as an organizer, we're all familiar with them, where nothing goes the way you planned, like literally nothing. <laughs> And um, so if you could tell us a little bit about that church scene where you were expecting one thing and a whole other thing happened, what happened that day? So um, I was expecting to meet with three workers. I thought that, um, you know, I'd be able to sort of sit quietly at church with them. Um, the man who called me, um, he insisted on remaining anonymous. And for a while, he wouldn't even agree to meet. But he said that the small, narrow window of freedom he got during his work week was for church on Sunday. And so I said, okay, well, I could pretend to be a churchgoer, and by kismet, we'd just meet up at this church. Um, you're from India, and I'm from India, and so we'd start a conversation. He agreed to meet on this pretext, but um, he told me in his particular English that the name of the church was the Secret Catholic Church. So I went on a hunt to find the secret Catholic church in Mississippi. I found it. It was actually the Sacred Heart Catholic Church. Um, I had, uh, my Hindi was very rusty. I had prepared an elaborate speech. Even if I was only meeting three men, I wanted to really make an impression. So I, I actually called my mother and she wrote out a speech for me. I was rehearsing it all the way into the church. When I opened it, there weren't three men. There were about a hundred. I gave my speech, and it was a disaster. It fell flat on its face. Um, and then I realized none of the men had understood me. They weren't from North India. They didn't speak Hindi. They spoke Tamil and Malayalam. They were from South India. Um, and I had to give it again in English. Um, the men streamed out, and, and, and it was only after that that one guy who was sitting deep in the room reached out to me, um, and he really became my organizing partner, my partner who kind of helped craft the great escape, engineered the heist scene that's at the center of the book. Mm -hmm. We're gonna come back to the heist scene and what happens after, um, but I wanna talk about some of the characters in the book and one of my favorite characters is a villain character, the liberal immigration lawyer who ends up at the center of this horrific epic labor trafficking uh, scene. Talk to us about this weird character and how in the world did he come to be in this situation? Yeah, um, this is one of the more fascinating um, stories that I unearthed in writing the book. Um, the 500 men who came from India were promised green cards, which is you know another way of saying that sort of piece of paper that allows you permanent residency and citizenship in the United States. They were promised good jobs. They thought that in nine months, their wives would come with their children and they'd start their American lives. All these promises were made by a liberal New Orleans attorney who flew to India and sort of developed this scheme. Um, he was supplying these workers with his partners to a big Gulf Coast-based oil rig builder um, that was fixing up oil rigs that had broken up after, um, you know, after Katrina. Uh, the men, of course, arrived, and it turned out all the promises were false. There were no green cards. There were no, um, there were no jobs. Uh, there were no good jobs. Uh, men were working in round-the-clock shifts in atrocious conditions. Uh, and so it, it was even more surprising to really learn about Malvern Burnett's background. This is a guy who was um, a liberal, he was an idealist. He considered himself the immigrant's best friend. Uh, and in fact, um, when he was a kid, um, his parents, the good Catholics that they were, uh, took in two Cuban refugees who taught Malvern baseball and you know, sat around the dinner table. Um, but after Hurricane Katrina, uh, Malvern went into a personal and financial crisis. And I think that's what got him to develop the scheme and sell it to a large company. There's so many complex um, 
characters and relationships. And um, in organizing, we form these very deep uh, relationships. It's all rooted in trust and relationship. And um, some of the people that you meet, the workers, and the relationships that you form with them are incredibly deep. Um, talk to us about some of those relationships. And it's, there's one in particular that just broke my heart in a thousand pieces because I could so picture it. Um, you know, you develop an intimacy through this incredible process of campaigning and taking risk and building and, and things don't always turn out the way that you want, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I was really in the foxhole with the men at the center of the book. And so um, they trusted me over time. I had to win, um, I had to win them over. And so to win them over, I, you know, I had to share things about my life that even many people in my family uh, didn't know. One man in particular, the one you're talking about, um, is a man named Rajan. He was the one who reached out to me after that disastrous meeting. And um, he was both the kind of friend and organizing partner that a labor organizer dreams of. Mm -hmm. He was brilliant. He was mm -hmm. funny. Um, he knew about the economy, so he could pick apart this company. So he taught me about the company. He taught me about the pressures of the men, um, the scheme itself, and he taught me how to cook. And over all these meals, we engineered this insane, out of a heist movie escape. Um, and that was also fun. You know, it, we, we got to be friends solving problems. For example, um, I would smuggle Rajan um, Indian ingredients for him to take back into the labor camp so that he could cook Indian food and revive the men. Why was that so essential? What were they eating? Well, the, in the labor camp, you know, the men were, and, and you have to understand this in the context of the work they were doing and also how they were living. They were living in a labor camp that the company itself called a man camp facility. That, that was the big sign. Um, it was constructed out of trailers on a toxic waste dump, and the men were living- Literally a toxic a waste. A real toxic waste dump um, for which they hadn't, you know, um, figured out how to kind of stop the waste from oozing out when they planted the trailers in the ground. Um, you know, the, the men were living 24 to a trailer uh, and working 12-hour shifts round the clock uh, on big platforms doing heavy work, you know, exhausting work. And to sustain themselves, they were eating rice. The, the only thing the company would serve them uh, is frozen rice. There wasn't even a microwave. So the men would suck on frozen rice to warm it. And that's what was sustaining them. So, you know, you go up to people like that and you say, hey, how about you come with me instead and escape and we start a struggle for your freedom? You know, they're going to say no. Uh, the way that Rajan recruited them to meetings was with this smuggled food and he would commandeer the kitchen and cook for them. And, uh, and that was one of the creative solutions that worked and that also formed our friendship. The, um, the other thing that happened was that, um, y you know, Rajan and I partnered to kind of concoct the scheme that would get the men out and, mm -hmm. and came up with this really elaborate but completely fictitious wedding um, that was supposedly happening across the Pascagoula River at a hotel. Um, and we used that pre pretext and a series of bribes um, really horrible uh, flavored cigars and, uh, and wild turkey whiskey um, to bribe the security guards and ferry the men out um, to, to get them out to, you know, to execute the great escape. So there was just like all these incredible um, sort of bonding experiences that turned Rajan and, and I into brothers. Uh, and then, without giving too much away, um, tragically, then we broke up our, our, our friendship couldn't really, um, our friendship didn't really um, last under the inten intense pressure of being hunted down by immigration agents. Mm. Uh, one of the things that was really special for me in reading this book is that um, Socket and I actually met in 2007 right as 
the great escape had happened and you were on this journey and so right in the thick of this story so i dropped in at a certain point um and basically what had happened was you were already on this journey that i want you to talk about and uh, i get a call from a mutual friend of ours a woman named sarita gupta who was the director of jobs with justice um, yay, Sarita, um, at the time. And she said, uh, my friend Socket, who I've been wanting you to meet for a while, he really needs to get in touch with you. He has a favor to ask. Um, and we talked, and it turns out he was on his way um, marching from New Orleans to Washington and needed a place to stay for 60 men. <laughs> and of course I said, well, come stay at my house. <laughs> And that's how I met Socket, is on the living room floor with lots and lots of men in the middle of this story. And little did I know there was all of this context at the time, but that's how we, that's how we first met, right? That is actually how we met. And um, I don't know if you remember this, but um, during that visit, um, I was also, uh, the other favor that I wanted from you was I, I wanted you to come back to New Orleans with me and conduct a citizen's arrest of um, the traffickers at the center of the book. I couldn't put that on her schedule. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was an incredible journey. Um, you know, the plan was that right after the Great Escape, 500 men from a Mississippi labor camp would file a Department of Justice complaint, a, a trafficking complaint. Now, trafficking is a federal crime, and our calculation was that the DOJ would start an investigation. Uh, when those investigations start, um, then the witnesses and vit victims at the center of it get protections. And uh, there are laws in place to give undocumented people uh, legal protections until their case is heard. Um, so we really thought the DOJ would do that. What we didn't know was that there was an enemy deep inside the federal government. Um, who was, through his own machinations, unraveling our plans, and, um, you know, and he, he had his own very deep, sinister, personal motivations to get the workers arrested and deported. Not knowing any of that, we hid the men, 500 men, in a New Orleans hotel that was in complete disrepair, but at some point, we decided to come out, like, many, many social movements. Um, these men came out to their families first as undocumented, then to the world, and we decided to march to the Department of Justice. What we hadn't figured out, though, is where to stay. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, terribly great at logistics, um, and so I called Sarita, and I was like, look, you've got to help me out. I've got about 60 men and 40 staff, and I need a place to stay. And um, so we wound up in New York, in um, Queens. Queens, yes, in Queens. Um, and uh, one of the scenes I'll never forget is, um, so these men, despite everything, you know, really cared about how they came across. They wanted to look good. And uh, the older ones uh, used to use this awful hair dye. And so at one point, you had a roommate who got up out of bed and you know the poor woman went to her bathroom to brush her teeth and there was an older indian man dyeing his hair in the sink you know and he and he looked up and he said good morning ma'am and i think there was a, sh a scream i'm not sure <laughs> i remember now and the sink was literally red for the sink was red for weeks weeks yeah yeah, yeah. i do remember that um i want to go back to this march right, from New Orleans. Um, because in many ways, you, I mean, there are so many beautiful uh, references and influences, but you were in some ways following in the footsteps and really with the kind of tactical and strategic um, legacy of the civil rights movement. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. The men were, um marching through Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi um, with signs that said dignity and I am a man. The signs from the sanitation workers strike in Memphis mm -hmm. in 1968. And, um, and it wasn't just that strike. Uh, you know, my mentors in New Orleans were an entire generation of civil rights leaders. Um, they were people who 
incredibly, were uh, still trying to rebuild their own homes after Hurricane Katrina. Many were still out of their homes. These are the people I had read about, I had sort of dreamed of meeting, and suddenly I was in New Orleans, and we would meet, and I would help them fix up their homes while they taught me about their life and history. They became my mentors, and when um, it was time to support these men, um, they became the mentors of these men. And so one of the people in the book, for example, is someone both of us know and love, um, uh, Reverend Nelson Johnson. Um, Reverend Nelson Johnson and uh, Joyce Johnson are two extraordinary um, labor organizers in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, I, I had, you know, barely ever met them uh, before getting on the march. And we rolled into Greensboro, North Carolina, at two in the morning, and there was Reverend Johnson outside his church with a key. And for the next two days, we just slept on his floor and learned from him. And it was really important for the workers, especially, to get that kind of training, because it wasn't just about how to protest. Um, these black civil rights organizers in the South had the best analysis of anyone right. of what we were really up against when we were fighting this federal government. Mm -hmm. And the workers, well, they actually had more faith in America than most Americans. You know, they thought that once they get to Washington, they'll get the justice they deserve. Mm. They would say, well, it's right in the name, the Department for Justice, which is what they would call it. And it took these black civil rights leaders to explain that this was going to be a long, arduous fight if it was a fight with the government. Um, and they were right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, you know, there's, you do so much incredible organizing still to this day, and I want to talk about that in a minute. But um, what made you decide that you needed to write this book? You know, um, despite all the awful, atrocious indignities um, that the men experienced that I would learn about. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that really moved me, the ones that, that really moved the workers and that really moved me and stuck with me were the things that can't be seen. It wasn't the 24 people to a trailer. It wasn't the food. It wasn't the work. One of those stories was um, there's a character in the book named Ebi Raju. And his is a beautiful he's love story. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's just a, he's just an incredible man, too. Um, he, he was a 27-year-old uh, welder in India. And he was resisting his mother, who was trying to force him into a, an arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. you know? And then he accidentally talks to his bride-to-be on the phone and falls in love with her. And their love story is just a story for the ages. He comes to America expecting her to join him in nine months. One day, he's 20 foot high on a platform, and his phone rings, and it's his wife. She was pregnant before she, he left, and she's going into emergency surgery. And the son that was born that day, Ebi couldn't see that son for the next three years because he was being held captive by this company. And those are the kinds of stories that never fit into the advocacy. They never fit into the men's applications for relief. And I always thought, when this is all over, they really need to write this story. Um, and so for a while, I was really convinced, I was trying to convince, uh, I was basically trying to lobby Barbara Ehrenreich to write it. And she said, it's, it's not really, I think you should write it. And so I, I, you know, I eventually ended up did, but it, it wasn't really my intention to be the one to write the story, but I, I knew these stories had to be told. And then what was it like, I mean, as organizers, we are trained in some ways to have it, the story not be about us and really have it be about the workers and the people and the community. And you wrote yourself into the story in, I think, such a powerful and beautiful and essential way. What was that like? Thank you. Yeah, that was also unexpected. Um, I knew I had to be a light narrator of the book. I wasn't expecting to be in it. Um, and initially, it was really a practical problem I had to solve, which is that this book contains so many worlds, the world of India, the world of uh, a Mississippi labor camp, the world of the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina, 
And these are worlds that I know intimately, and I needed the reader to come and know them. And so for that, I, I really needed to be the tour guide. Mm -hmm. I needed to be the Virgil figure, like telling you how a, an oil rig is built, or telling you why these men's stakes are really high, you know, what they've been promised. So I thought it would be a journalistic account with me every now and then popping in as a character to kind of explain. But then I realized that um, basically we don't like to read about characters unless they're full-blown human beings. That's right. We don't like to read people who are, you know, perfect. We, we like to read people who are changing, who are unformed, who are growing. Um, and so then I, I realized that I really had to embrace telling the story of my 27-year-old self. Um, and uh, unlike my 45-year-old self, my, my Which 20, is perfect. It's perfect. My 27-year-old self didn't have his act together, you know. Uh, I was, I was really, I hadn't called India in months uh, at the beginning of the book. I was, uh, you know, I had cut off ties, in essence, uh, with a lot of, uh, parts of my home. Uh, I, I never called home. Um, I had become an American in all but passport um, and and was really, um, the last thing I was expecting was men from India to become central to my life. Um, and so I, I decided to embrace talking about that and about my own um, immigration crisis um, in the book. Uh, and and um, uh, and it was hard to do, but now I'm glad I did it. It wasn't, it wasn't how I started out, um, but I'm glad I made that decision at the end. Do you think telling this story has made you a better organizer? Yeah, I think so, because um, writing a book makes you think really deeply about people's interiority mm -hmm. and uh, their motivations mm -hmm. um, and it also, you have now the job of explaining their choices and all their complexity to a reader who doesn't know them. Uh, that's a lot of what we do as organizers, right? We, we become embedded inside a group of people mm -hmm. who aren't recognized and who aren't understood. And we try to tell stories in a way that the world broadly will understand. These people who we know and love, I, I really, felt very lucky to get to know to, to get to do that for these men and it it made me um, it made me a better listener mm. um, the other thing is I also got to interview a lot of the bad guys in the book and to make them interesting I really had to stand in their shoes I needed to understand why they made the choices they make even the ice agent who hunts down these men and is motivated to deport them you know I ended up meeting up with him and trying to understand him and formed a kind of friendship with him that continues to this day. When you read this book, you'll realize it's, it's not only extraordinary storytelling, but it's also deeply researched. And you must have read through historical documents and, I mean, talk to us a little bit about the process of how you assembled all of the inputs to create this well, there were, um, yeah, there was a lot of material to sift through. There were the men and their stories, of course, and that was hours and hours of interviews. Um, the, at the center of the campaign was uh, a Department of Justice complaint and litigation. Mm -hmm. um, the civil case that the men brought against the company and its recruiters was huge, it was sprawling, and so I had to make a narrative out of tens of thousands of court documents um, and uh, hundreds of hours of depositions. Um, and then there was some really interesting historical research. Um, the ICE agent at the center of the book um, is someone who, um, you know, I was trying to find, and, and I learned that his family is really ubiquitous in Mississippi. Um, his ancestors arrived in the early 1700s um, from, from Europe, uh, and the Ladner line uh, has been in the Mississippi Gulf Coast since then. And I found this incredible 900-page document. It's actually called the Ladner Odyssey, and it lives in the bowels of 
the Bay St. Louis Public Library. And um, I was only allowed there uh, every other day for some reason. Um, and so I would hang out there Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays reading this 900 page long document. Uh, it was completely fascinating. Um, and, then I, and then I wound up you know, reaching out to the historians who wrote it and they connected me to the actual ICE agent. This is extraordinary. It was amazing, it was amazing. <laughs> amazing. I mean, if you have any reason <laughs> to look at 900 page documents in Bay St. Louis, uh, from family historians, don't pass up the chance. It's fascinating. Were there any other moments in your process that you were really surprised or taken aback like that? Well, um, there were a few things. I mean, one was, despite the extraordinarily painful experiences these men went through, I was really amazed at how much joy was in their stories mm -hmm. as I started interviewing them. They didn't only remember the labor camps, they remembered the love stories that brought them to America. Um, so that was really beautiful, it was really surprising. Um, all my interviews with the men at the center of the book were conducted over meals. So I was probably um, the most well-fed author who ever wrote a nonfiction book. Um, it was really amazing. Um, yeah, and then I think my, um, I think, you know, one of the things that was surprising to me, and I, I know, you know, you're also an organizer who wrote a book, and I, I, I'm very curious how this went for you, but, you know, I was running an organization while I was writing this mm -hmm. book, um, and you were too, mm -hmm. and so we don't have the luxury of, like, you know, blocking off days for writing. Um, I was dealing with, you know, I was waking up at four to write till eight, and then dealing with my perennial budget crisis at <laughs> 9 p.m. for my fledgling nonprofit. So it was, it I'm was getting a, hives it was just rough. Hearing you yeah, talk yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound but familiar? But you did it. I did it. Yeah, I did How it. How long yeah. did it take you? It took 16 years to live the story with sort of all the codas and endings. Uh, and then four years to write it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, round of applause. Extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> and now we have this, I think it will go down as a just an incredibly important book about human trafficking, about the immigrant experience in this country, and about courage, organizing. I mean, there's so many um, ways in, in which I find this to be a very significant um, book and contribution. So I just want to say thank you for thank you. taking thank the you. time and making that happen. Thank you, Aijin. Um, I want to talk for a minute about your work, and I also want all of you to be thinking about your questions, because I know you have them for Socket. Um, so the workers in this story in many ways were some of the first resilience workers, workers who, um, who you organize, who come to cities and communities around the country after, in the aftermath of climate disasters. And they respond and they rebuild and they are the kind of lifeblood of our resilience as a country that is in living through the midst of the cl climate crisis as it unfolds. And I just um, want you to talk for a moment about um, the, the kind of development of this body of work and where this organizing is now. What are some of the, how are these issues of climate and work and jobs and immigration, how is it coming together now in your work? Yeah, these workers, I didn't know it at the time when I met them, but they were the first of um, a large growing number of workers who would be mostly immigrant, mostly undocumented, um, and who would power the rebuilding of homes and schools and cities um, after disasters. Um, when I was uh, in New Orleans right after Hurricane Katrina, uh, all of these workers would gather in one place in New Orleans. 
uh, it was this place that became the hiring hub, a place called Lee's Circle. It was, they would stand, black and brown workers, under a 60-foot tall monument to Robert E. Lee. And uh, there at dawn, contractors would pull up in buses, workers would clamber on, I'd follow them onto the buses, and we'd drive out to these still dark, distant corners of the Gulf Coast to rebuild. Well, Katrina was supposed to have been a 100-year storm, but since Katrina, there have been over $200 billion disasters. Um, and not just hurricanes in the southeast, but flooding in the Midwest, fires in California. And after every disaster, it's a largely migrant, largely transient workforce, mostly made up of immigrants, but also a number of people who are itinerant, itinerant US-born mm -hmm. workers who are rebuilding together. And the amazing thing about it is um, these disasters and the fact that immigrants are rebuilding after disasters, disasters create this rare opening in American life and American politics where a lot of things are possible. Hmm. And one of the most interesting thing that becomes possible is friendships hmm. between people born in the US who thought their most important political issue was the wall, building a wall to keep strangers out, who are now being helped by strangers hmm. to come back home. And I've just seen again and again these friendships and these, uh, these born, bonds form. So when catastrophes happen, disasters happen, workers follow storms. And my team and I at Resilience For Force follow workers. We try to protect workers, but we also try to build these bridges and bonds between residents and workers. Mm. That is such powerful work. Thank you for that. Um, I think that when there's a whole conversation about the future of work and a lot of it has to do with technology, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, how the robots are taking all of our jobs. But when we really look at where is the work, it is so human and so much about these bonds and what is required of us as people in this time. And I just find the work that you do really calling the best of us forward mm. um, in that context and, uh, and creating the context for amazing things. It's not just disasters, but it's great organizing like what you're doing. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we actually, um, all this work in the resilience economy, uh, you know, we have a lot of teachers and, and one of the models of it is work you've been leading in the care economy. Care and resilience are, are similar in, in, in many ways. I mean, you've got, you know, you've got this um, extraordinary need, and then the people serving right at the middle of it are unrecognized and unprotected. And, um, and that's a sort of similar confluence that started to happen as these disasters became more frequent and destructive. Um, rather than um, seeing disasters as one-offs, terrible tragedies that we were unlucky enough to have befall us, but we'll go back to normal. We've now dispensed with going back to normal. Uh, we now are getting used to the fact that disasters are here to stay. Uh, there'll be more and more. And so a lot of people um, uh, are, suddenly millions of people are talking about resilience. Millions of people want to know what will make us resilient. And what we're sort of, our contribution to that is that you can't have resilience or recovery without this workforce at the center of it. And are you finding that people, um, government, elected officials, voters, people in these communities that are rebuilding shift in their um, thinking and uh, attitudes around immigrants and immigration in that context? We definitely are, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think of this Florida family uh, who, after a hurricane, uh, put up a sign that said, strangers will be shot. You know, this is a family that's not wealthy. Mm -hmm. You know, their house was built with their own hands and half of it is now broken. And um, you know, they have neither the means, nor the savings, nor the friends to borrow from to build back. So they do what is in their power, right? 
and they feel powerful. Um, they feel a measure of dignity in putting up that sign that says strangers will be shot because they're not going to let what few possessions are left be stolen by strangers. Well, you know, I saw that sign, I met that family, and the strangers who came to their house weren't um, a threat. They were my members. Mm -hmm. And on Sunday, one day, um, you know, instead of going to church, all of these immigrant workers just went to work and rebuilt their house. Mm -hmm. At the end, they had dinner with the workers. Uh, we provided interpreters. It was a beautiful din dinner, and we talked a lot about journeys and how no one's quite where they seem to be from, right? Uh, no one's from the place they, they seem to be from, and everyone is from somewhere else. Um, a profound conversation. And at the end of that dinner, they took down that sign. So I have a lot of faith in ordinary people when their homes are flooded to focus on the right problems. Mm -hmm. And I think those bonds aren't inevitable, but if we're there to form them, they can form. Um, we all know, everybody says it now, part of a, a big source of our resilience is friendships. And you know, part of the organizing work after disasters is to help these friendships form. Here, here. Um, okay, I want to invite uh, the audience to bring forward questions for our author. And Sakhi. we're going to ask you to come down here so that everyone can hear, including our virtual viewers. So if you want to just come down while you have a question. And we'll start with a question from the virtual chat, which is, how can the average person help to support immigrants and prevent things like this from happening again? Well, um, I think one way is just to talk about immigrant stories um, wherever you are, including your own immigrant story. I mean, we all have a story of migration. Um, and other than Native Americans and, and African Americans, um, Every other group has an immigrant story about coming to America. And, and so, you know, we have to shift the culture in which the only time an immigrant story is told is when something awful happened to somebody. We have to shift the culture in America where the immigrant is, um, you know, a, a blip on the border um, and, and rolled into a news cycle story about crisis. Um, so telling immigrant stories is a is a place to start. But also, wherever you live, there is an immigrant rights coalition in your hometown. And you can call them, volunteer for them, donate to them. Um, you know, everywhere in America, uh, wherever there are immigrants, um, there are organizations protecting them, but they need support. So wherever you li live, um, just do the, go the deep Google research that will lead you to that nonprofit and, and donate. Hi, Sakit. This is such a meaningful moment to see you again after 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I'm Nerissa Allegretti, community organizer with the National Alliance for Filipino Concerns. I visited your office in New Orleans several times in 2013 when we were seeking your assistance for several hundred Filipino traffic victims at the Grand Isle shipyard in Galeano, Louisiana. Uh, similar terrible things happened to the Filipino workers, starting with the expose of their trafficking after the explosion of the Black Elk oil rig in November 16 of 2012. Uh, also, after Typhoon Katrina, there were over 300 Filipino teachers uh, which were trafficked in uh, Baton Rouge. So my question is, how can we continue to advocate for change in the U.S. immigration law such as the J-1 visa and the guest worker visa that had several loopholes in it that is used by traffickers to take advantage of skilled workers from oppressed nationalities and third world countries. Thank you. Yeah, I remember you and your crew so well and it's so amazing to reconnect. And um, I especially remember those incredibly brave workers and um, 
what was so special about that group of workers, they had come from the Philippines, they had a similar story, uh, equally tragic as, as this group. Um, and I remember one Sunday where we banded the workers together, uh, they had stolen out of their labor camp and we got together uh, and uh, all we did that entire day was sing. And these Filipino workers and your crew just knew all these beautiful songs. Um, and, and it was actually the workers giving us hope rather than the other way around. It was a really beautiful day. I, I think that um, you're raising a really important sort of point, which is that all these visa programs, whether they're high tech uh, visa programs that supply you know, immigrant workers to, the, to Silicon Valley uh, or domestic workers, um, or these kinds of laborers that are in the book, welders and pipe fitters for heavy industry. Um, in so many of these industries, these visas have been um, utilized um, as temp agencies. You know, they've become Trojan horses uh, to bring in easily exploited, uh, easy ex easily exploited workers who are too uh, scared to come forward and report abuse. Um, and this hurts American workers too. These workers in this book, uh, you know, the workers were brought into a labor camp that the company, that uh, the federal, a federal judge recognized as human trafficking. Um, but the recruiters earned millions, and the company got the most skilled workers in the world at a fraction of the cost to American workers. So what we all really need to be advocating for is a migrant worker system that doesn't pit workers against each other, but brings them uh, at the same wages, at the same working conditions, uh, in a way that they can be in solidarity with the people here who have those jobs. That's what we should all be advocating for. And, and, and many of us, uh, you know, um, uh, are doing that work. It's, it's just something that um, we need to remind uh, the government to make it a priority uh, as they debate immigration reform. Hi, Saket. Hi, Carrie. You? This is unbelievable. I have not seen Carrie in years and years, but she was one of my closest, most wonderful friends in college. So I'm like, I, I completely am so amazed. I'm so proud to be here and <laughs> to see you on TV and to see you on podcast. I can't even tell you. Like, oh. I'm not an emotional person, but it. I am so happy to be here and to support you. How wonderful my daughter's to see you. Here oh my God. She, she's eight, and so and oh. she uh, she was like, "What are we doing?" I'm like, we are going to go see an amazing person. So, <laughs> but um, one of the things I really wanted to ask you was, um, you know, you were undocumented for a time, and that is such a personal thing to come out and say. It's scary for people to come out and say. My my family comes from an immigration family too. And so it's one of those things that are, you don't want to talk about. You don't want all of a sudden someone to know and something to happen or you know someone who's like that. And so how how can you support people in those situations not to be afraid to help advocate for them and just kind of I guess how hard I know you're legal with your visas and everything now but that still had to be a scary thing to admit and say to the world yeah it was absolutely a scary thing at the time and um, continues to be for many people what helped me at the time was um, that um, I had you know you know when I became undocumented I was um, I think it you know probably among the most privileged immigrants to become undocumented. I was an English-speaking student at the University of Chicago. I had a college degree. I had connections. I had relationships. Um, you know. And so initially when I fell out of status, I, I didn't really um, pay much attention. My life continued. What really changed was 9-11. And that's still what immigrants are experiencing today. The immigrant communities are still living in an America that is shaped by the aftermath um, where, you know, conservatives, particularly in the South, defeated immigration reform efforts um, because of the opportunity handed to them by this awful tragedy. I mean, the tragedy was a tragedy, um, but it was used as an opportunity to roll back rights at so many levels. Um, and it created this atmosphere of, of fear that, that, um, that people live in. And I think the first place to start is just to be that trusting friend, 
where someone would want to come to you and admit that they're afraid. Um, that's what really saved me. Uh, after 9-11, I was very scared, and I had one friend. Uh, she was an organizer in Chicago. Uh, her name was Doran Schrantz. And uh, one day, months into my undocumented immigrant experience, uh, after I had been evicted from my apartment um, and, and, uh, and didn't have a place to go, I finally broke down and told her why my life was coming apart. Um, and that really saved me. Um, so I think it really does, like, like many forms of coming out, it really is just a very intimate experience and you have to be that friend um, that's available to someone who wants to tell you that. Hello, I just wanted to thank you so much for the work and the labor that you put into um, writing this story down. And I, I think about the narrative change, you know, potential of a story like this. And um, I'm hoping and, and wondering, you know, are you, um, is anyone reaching out to you to like make a movie of this, like to create media around it? Because I think this, you know, there's very human themes in this story. Um, but I also think it really illustrates the role of organizing and relationships and social change, um, not just for adults, but even like the power of that for children as well. And if you had a movie, who would you, uh, who would you pick to play you? <laughs> Wow, thank you for that amazing compliment. I, um, I, I'm, I, I'm so thrilled that the scenes in the book are vivid enough um, that you're asking about a movie. Um, I, I will say on a serious note, I, I think, um, you know, I think the design of the book was um, to make it scenic and to make it about relationships. Um, it's not a book about policy. It's not a book um, about uh, laws. It's a book about human beings in love uh, and the love that makes them jet out to a foreign land. Not just love for their wives or love for their parents, but even love for their unborn children. You know, the idea that if I come to America, the next generation that doesn't even exist right now uh, will be better. I mean, that's the kind of imaginative act it is to immigrate to America. I mean, that requires imagination. I mean, if, if 500 people could have that level of imagination, um, then I, you know, I figured, God, I could at least muster up enough to write a book about it. Um, and it was just an honor to write about it. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that more stories like this are needed. Um, you know, uh, domestic workers, farm workers, all these people who we think of as workers are also full human beings with deep, deep stories. Um, and, and I hope that this is part of a renaissance where we see a lot more uh, uh, books about people who labor, people whose work, um, you know, keeps us uh, able to exist, survive, these people who are essential. Um, I hope we see a cultural renaissance where there's a lot more books that help us meet these people and see them and recognize them. And who would play you? Oh, good Lord, I have no idea who would play me. Um, but um, I, 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 I was doing a fun exercise about the, the casting of the bad guys. Um, so I, 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 can, I can talk more about that, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is a very I'm fun, taking, this is a very fun question. I'm taking suggestions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Saka, thank you so much for writing this book. I would say it's right up there with the Age of Dignity by <laughs> Ai-jen Poo. Um, this is our friend, Bill Dempsey. Bill Dempsey. <laughs> um, since we're here in Chicago, which played a formative role in your development as an organizer, I was just wondering, um, if you'd share some more reflections about the organizing tradition here that you ended up connecting with and sent you on this path. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, so um, I'm so thrilled you asked because I get to tell this story, which is one of my favorites. I was trying to start a theater company in Chicago. I had a tiny little theater company, um, and it was basically a ragtag group of refugees and undocumented immigrants um, eating and then devising plays and taking them into 
um, mostly ESL classes, but I had my sights set on a grander thing, you know. So, so I would run around trying to get people to, uh, to help me, you know, form this much bigger theater company. Um, and, and right around then, I also figured out that I wanted to be an organizer. And somebody gave me the name of this guy uh, who they said I should really talk to. He was a guy who they said had been a documentary filmmaker, but he was also an organizer. And to top it off, he was a banjo player. So I go to this guy, and he's just, you know, there's a, there's a card table, and, um, and a, I think there was a swinging light. I mean, it basically looked like, you know, interrogations were, were carried out in this room. Uh, not a plush couch, uh, uh, I, I should add. No mint, no mint outside, you know. Not a, not a plush office, but in there was a guy called George Gale. And, um, you know, he was, he, he was working for um, People's Action, uh, National People's Action, it was called at the time, or, or something else. Um, National Training and Information Center. I mean, what an extraordinarily appealing brand, you know? The National Training and Information Center. And I was like, what the hell am I doing here? But, but I met George Gale and, um, and that was really one of my first conversations with a Chicago organizer. And through him and other people, I came to understand that um, I didn't just want to be an, uh, an organizer. I, w I wanted to be an organizer, and I happened to be living in a place with like, all this incredible storied history. Um, and I started to soak in that history. So I, I became a neighborhood organizer. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I think the, 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 the thing I really gained from that, that I used a lot in New Orleans, um, was that um, no matter what else you're doing, you just have to knock on your 40, 50 doors a day. You just have to keep talking to 40, 50 people a day. If you're not doing that, uh, and you're just having breakfast, you know, and making plans, um, then you're not organizing. It was the act, it was the muscle. Um, I, really, I really got a lot of that from my Chicago years. Um, I was really lucky. There isn't a better place to get started as an organizer, I don't think. Hi, Salika. Hi, Susan. So I get to claim that I was one of his teachers in college. So Susan and... was my college professor, and um, when I wanted to start this tiny little theater company, Susan actually gave me my first grant to do it. Um, so Susan, thank you for believing in me uh, despite my crazy hair and my weird clothes and my terrible lack of punctuality for our, for our meetings. You really stu stood, st stuck it out with me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it wasn't my money. It was <laughs> money that the MacArthur Foundation had given to the Human Rights Center at the university and that my predecessor hadn't spent, so I've got to get this out the door. And Socket had this idea for the Antigone Project, which was really wonderful. We can talk about that later. So now I'm going to ask you something that has nothing to do with that, which is really sort of a, a policy question. One of the things we hear is that, and we've seen historically, is that there are governments and political forces willing to welcome in workers to work, but they don't see them as future citizens. I mean, that's something we've seen over and over again. And now there's word is out that we should be expanding guest worker programs because it would enable people to travel safely, which the workers themselves want to do. They'd rather come on an airplane than slog through the Darien Gap, for example. But, what would, but there are so many structural problems with those temporary worker programs. So questions of family separation, questions of you're only allowed to be here as long as you're working for that employer. Could there be an ideal temporary worker program, and what would it have to, what would it have to include? Yeah, and what a great time to ask that question, because I think we're sort of really reassessing lots of parts of immigration and labor policy. Um, I think if you, when I have talked to workers and when I ask workers, what they want is more choices. You know, they want the choice to stay. They want that choice to be available to them. If they spent, you know, nine months rebuilding New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, or they just spent, um, you know, eight months in a field in California, um, right now what they're stuck with is either they fall out of status at the end and become undocumented and stay, 
or they go back and come back the next season on multiple kinds of visas, and that keeps you uh, sort of in a permanent temporary state. And instead, what many workers want is the choice to stay and become American if they want to. Um, but the choice is the important thing. That's where the dignity is. Um, well, many workers may want to come for three years and then go back and spend time with their parents and come back again for another stint. There are situations where, uh, where that's possible. Many of these workers in this book worked in the Middle East, and they'd go for two or three years at a time, build things in the Middle East, come back to India. Uh, when they talked about the US guest worker program, they said that conditions in the Middle East, in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, were far more humane, and the immigration system made a lot more sense. Um, but of course, America is where you can earn dollars, and dollars convert in, in, into more. And so, you know, I think that's what workers want. Um, I think you have to develop this in a way that um, allows workers to earn the same wages as U.S.-born workers, so that immigrants aren't undercutting U.S. workers. Um, but there really is enough work for everyone. I mean, just to give you a little example, in New Orleans, in Louisiana alone, um, because of floods, um, there is now enough money and enough uh, demand to take 17,000 homes and put them on stilts. Now, it is very hard to put 17,000 homes on stilts. It's hard to put one house on stilts. Who's going to do that work? You know, we need the workers. We need training. We need. Um, all of this infrastructure, we need a nation to be rebuilt to withstand the coming, cri the, the coming uh, disasters and the climate crisis. So we do need the workers, and it is possible to develop a program um, that can be good for workers, U.S. born and American, and good for industry. I would add that when it, in the context of care, it's very similar that there's a huge need a growing aging population, 10,000 people turning 65 every day and living longer. And most people want to age at home and in their communities, connected to the lives they know. And in order to do that, we need an infrastructure, including a really strong workforce, to support a dignified quality of life for the huge numbers of people who are aging. and. Um, and there should be both, in my mind, a pathway to legal status and citizenship for the undocumented who are here, who do that work and can do that work and want to continue to do that work. And there is so much to do. It's really an all-hands-on-deck situation when it comes to care, and I think it's similar when it comes to a resilient economy, a climate-resilient economy. and so. I think the old false choices, um, we, we need to actually um, think about what the real choices are and, and the key being choice for the workers and dignity, which really is about ensuring that everyone who's doing this work has access to a quality job, the ability to organize and be a part of a union, dignified wages, working conditions, these kind of rights that enable choice for workers. And if we can do that, so much is possible. We can totally come up with a temporary worker program. We can legalize, we can do a lot of things, but it has to have some different assumptions than what we've been working with in the mm -hmm. past, I think. Mm -hmm. Hi, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for writing this book. I just picked up this book yesterday and before the meeting, this, uh, this conference, and I just read chapter one. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for reading. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to say, I was so shocked that this, you talk, I, when I pick up the book, okay, immigration, I'm thinking about, okay, 30, 40, 60s. I was so shocked that this book actually is taking about, talking about Katrina, my time. And I know that you talk about that when there's a disaster, this kind of things happen, you know, beautiful things happen, that bad things happen. But I'm thinking, when there's a need, not disaster, in the beginning of this country, there's plantation, we need people. There comes the Africa people, slavery. And then we are building out west, we need railroad. 
is China. Same thing that happened here. I, I, read, I watch movie about Chinese people coming to America, being lied to, building the railroad, the condition that you mentioned here. And I'm just shocked that 2007, we are still talking about the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's wonderful that you are shocked, you know, because I think one of the reasons these things keep repeating is when we lose our capacity for shock. We lose, uh, when these stories stop becoming horrible to us, um, that's when we go into a kind of forgetting that allows it to happen again and again. And I said to myself, I must be so sheltered and so ignorant and without knowing any of this, so thank you again. Yeah, thank you for reading. Uh, thank you. No, but, but then uh, the second thing I want to say is that I, I, I have worked in corporations. Anytime anything happens, I'm in quality. The first thing we ask is we have to do root cause analysis. <coughs> we have to do six sigma. Why, why, why? Six sigma. Six, six why before we get to the root of it. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we have to say corrective. How do we correct this? And then next thing is preventive. How do we prevent it? So my question is, I know that you, know, you are doing, you talk about dignity and all this stuff, but this is at the end, at the receiver end. What are we doing at the leadership end? This has to stop on the leadership to change. Because like I said, from the, from the quality perspective, it's the leader that's driving us workers to make those things happen. Then we have to follow the procedure to do the root cause analysis, corrective preventive actions. What kind of corrective preventive action is our government doing so that, you know, 2023, I'm not going to read another book like this. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, I think there's a big need. And, um, you know, I think both of us, Aijin, through her work and, and I through mine, uh, are, you know, every day shouting through megaphones um, for the leadership of this country to recognize and hear these kinds of stories, right? And, and, and to correct things. It just, it, it just does, yes, it, it does. Yeah, it, it just takes time for systems to change. And so when, when, we have, when we have stories like this, you're exactly right. We then need to start thinking about how do we leverage these stories to make the change so that there isn't this same story happening again. Accountability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank we're, you for reading. We're running a little short on time, so we have time for just one more quick question. Hello, lovely to meet you. I think what is lovely with your book, I've not read it yet, so I'm looking forward to doing so, uh, is that you get into each character and help it helps you to kind of paint the picture of their life and how it transforms into the whole scheme of things, you know, but I have uh, a story myself. Um, I'm an immigrant from England, UK, and um, I came over, I met what I thought, who I thought was the love of my life, and, and we got married. We were married for seven years. He committed adultery, and then I decided to divorce him. Um, I met another gentleman. He was from Canada, and this, um, this man, I didn't realize, but he was actually working with the FBI to actually have me marry him for his stay in America. In America. He took me back to Canada. I went to Canada four years, went to university. Um, after university, uh, I came back to America and, you know, he, he had one of my friends hoax me into the whole married scheme, you know, so I married him. And that same year, um, a few months later, you know, there was a divorce and, you know, it, it was just this strange scheme. So um, when, after, you know, I went to Florida, met, you know, and started meeting people, I started to realize this correlation between the people that I was meeting. They were all immigrants, you know, legal, Im illegal immigrants and things like that. The FBI, what they did is that they actually got people and fronted them to come to me and form relationships and friendships with me in hopes that now they wanted to flip the picture on me because what they tried to say now is that I, they wanted to blame it on to me that I actually um, married him for his stay 
um, you know, married my first husband for his stay, and then now this next man. So they wanted to cover up the whole thing, you know. And then I, uh, I went to university to start a business. I start the business. The business gets sabotaged. I find out the FBI sabotaged it. The FBI, IRS, Trump's involved, Donald Trump. <laughs> and, um, yeah, okay. So they, yeah, so they sabotage my business, and now they're trying to murder me. I'm here in, in Chicago for refuge, basically. And... Uh, you know, my question was, did you run into FBI corruption when you was uh, in your, when you was writing your book or you was working then, was it for 16 years you said you was doing? doing the well, research? first of all, I'm so sorry that um, such unfortunate things happened to you. And I'm so grateful that despite all of it, you're still reading and coming out to events and, and, and being part of um, of this. Um, the, um, the book does include um, government actors. Um, I don't want to give it away, uh, but I really would love for you to read it and reach out to me and tell me what you think. Thank you. Well, friends, we have run out of time, but I want to thank you all for coming. I want to remind you that this book is, of course, available at your Chicago Public